failed to raise any question about what was being done in Afghanistan. Um, and so that bespeaks a relationship between news media and the uh, national security state that, that is very uh, problematic, very, uh, very much in need of not just analysis, but active, active uh, opposition and uh, sort of forceful, uh, forceful protest about the way in which the system operates. Um, and of course, the, the, what I call the national security state itself uh, is, is simply uh, repeating the same patterns over and over again. I mean, and you see, just in this morning's uh, <coughs> emails, I, I saw a, an article by Winslow Wheeler uh, pointing out that um, Obama's new Secretary of Defense uh, has basically turned the DOD back over to the Joint Chiefs uh, to let them decide on the key budgetary issues, whereas uh, no matter what his other faults, at least Bob, uh, Robert M. Uh, uh, Bob, Bob Gates uh, was, was attempting to wrest some control from the Joint Chiefs uh, over, uh, over the Pentagon budget. And, and so that's just yet another you know, instance in which uh, this pattern of, uh, of who really holds the power uh, in the uh, national security state and, and the United States uh, policymaking uh, in general uh, continues to, you know, to be more of the same and, and to, in fact, deepen as time goes by. And, and that reminds me of one point I wanted to make apropos of this uh, overall analysis about the mistake that the intelligence community began to make in the early 1990s about the telexes. They were responding, I mean, it wasn't a blank slate. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't sort of a neutral system that had been set up uh, to pursue the evidence regarding Iran's nuclear program. It was a system that was set up with incentives for the analysts and for the collectors in the intelligence community to find evidence that Iran and other possible nuclear states were in fact working on nuclear weapons. There were rewards in store for those people in the intelligence community who came up with this analysis. The rewards for those who found intelligence, raw intelligence that supported it. Uh, and this is a, a point that I make in a, in a chapter on intelligence failure, right? an entire chapter on that subject. And I quote a number of former intelligence officials agreeing that we have, we have had a problem here of a, a structure uh, of, of intelligence uh, collection and analysis which, uh, which, which leans in a certain direction because of the policymakers obviously encouraging through expectations, the finding of evidence that supports the policy. And the policy was already one of suspicion toward Iran, opposition to Iran, not finding a modus vivendi with Iran. Uh, and it was, that was perfectly well known by the people in the intelligence community. So, so it's no secret that that's going to have the effect. And someone as high ranking as Thomas Finger, who was the deputy uh, director of intelligence for, uh, for analysis uh, from 2005 to 2008, I believe it was, uh, yeah, 2008 or 2009, made that point quite forcefully in, in uh, an interview with me. And, and other former officials said something very similar, that this is a serious problem. So, so these are structural problems that are, need, to be, need to be dealt with. Um, and and it, all, it has to start with sort of citizen anger, citizen uh, activism, pushback, uh, and of course, being organized and being conscientious, conscious is the starting point for that. Great. Jamal, do you have a follow-up question? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, going back to my original question, you know, you say the terrorism issue really is going to be the next stumbling block for this, and I think that that's completely true. Uh, you know, if you go to the Hill and talk about this issue and people are starting to wrap their minds around the notion that we're going to have a nuclear settlement, they still say, well, we can't lift the sanctions unless the terrorism issue is resolved. And as you point out, we're not engaging on that. 
where we have a policy of selective engagement. We engage when there's a crisis. We're not engaging on the, the comprehensive issues. Um, but it does seem to me like this is a pivot point right now. And, you know, I mean, I think the media, well, I mean, in terms of the, you know, the, the advocacy activity, I mean, recently in the Senate, we had the defeat of a bill being pushed by APAC. Uh, we have, you know, the president really going to the mats to try to prevent new sanctions. It's unclear if he's going to be able to do that to get a final deal. But you have, you have a change there. You have a change, I think, in the way that this is being covered in the media. I think there's been a little bit more positive coverage of this. Uh, what do you what do you think are the, the opportunities ahead? How is how how does this get resolved? Well, uh, you've given me a chance to address the point that I had anticipated at the end of, of my remarks, which is that the findings in my book and the stories that are in my book, I think, are not just history. It's very relevant to precisely what you're asking about. What what is likely to take place now in the remainder of these months of negotiations and beyond. And I'm very concerned about the fact that the Obama administration has taken the initiative, insisting in the first round of negotiations on introducing, in effect, the, the laptop documents, if you will, they don't use that term, they call it, talk about possible military dimensions. Uh, that's what the senior administration official says is the issue that the United States is basically saying the Iranians must satisfy uh, the P5 plus one and the IAEA as far as that issue is concerned, as well as Parchin, which of course means the documents and intelligence that I was referring to earlier, which uh, I think the evidence is very, very strong that, the, that these are, that this is false. These are fake documents and false intelligence. And I don't see any, the slightest evidence that there are high officials in the Obama administration who are even slightly aware that that might be a problem. And so I, I see a, a showdown here when it gets to the point of, okay, let's sit down and talk about this possible military dimensions in Parchin. I mean, I, I think on Parchin, the Iranians can say, okay, when we reach an agreement, if everything else is worked out, you know, you can, you can have your IAEA visit to Parchin. I don't think that's a problem. But on the possible military dimensions uh, issue, I think that the Iranians are going to insist that these are fabrications. And uh, they have they had a 117-page memo that they turned over to the IAEA. And I'll be damned if I can get the Iranians to spring that loose. They, they, they've never released it. They're very careful about not releasing uh, the documents that they've given to the IAEA. But uh, they, you know, they, they raised a number of problems with, with, the, uh, with the documents, um, some of which I've, I've covered in my own articles, but um, the question is whether the Obama administration you know, senior officials are really prepared to back off and say, okay, we acknowledge that you're right. I, I wonder if, uh, you know, you've seen some of the speculation by people like Mark Hibbs that really what they want the Iranians, what they hope the Iranians will say, what the Iranians could say is, well, we know that you know that we did this, but uh, we can't say so publicly, or if we do say so, it'll have to be very guarded. They're not gonna say anything like that. The Iranians are not gonna admit it because they don't believe it's true. And so that, that's a serious problem, I think, in the final stage of negotiations. Perhaps as serious or more serious than the naughty technical problems that, that they have to unravel in order to get to an agreement. Um, so I, I really think that we, we need to sort of um, talk to some of the administration officials. Maybe you have some contact with them. I hope maybe you can talk sense to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew. Well, one other thing, which is the, um, <coughs> you sort of touched on this in a way, that the, the degree to which the administration, I mean, the really, well, the administrations have understood perfectly well all along the Iranians aren't building a bomb. And for all the reasons we can all think of without going too wide. You know, the, the, the question of the Iranian bomb is pointless. So as the Iranians themselves said, well, what can we do with one bomb? So, and the Iranians, I mean, from Bob's remark, you know, remarks that the leadership there has made, they, they say, well, we know, I mean, I think Hamane said this to back in England, um, Dublin, um, uh, in, in Tehran, 
the seventh floor. So we know perfectly well this is all, you know, this is, you don't really care very much about the nuclear issue. It's, uh, that it's regime change. You know, it's what you're interested in is regime change. And as you say in the early part of your book, you say, well, the Iranians, they, they, they regard an enrichment program as a sort of, sort of deterrent. So therefore,